a lot of times you think that when someone has these kind of ideas, you're thinking, are they trying too hard to be edgy and cool and not nerd-like, or do they really kind of think this way? If you have been watching my channel for a little while, it's no secret that Twisted Metal Black is easily my favorite game in the series. It's pitch-dark theme set in a bleak, upsetting world full of demented psychopaths playing host to a plague of evil as it spreads itself further and wider is something I find myself endlessly fascinated and intrigued by. I love Twisted Metal Black as a world, I love its characters and their stories, I love the idea of Black, but do I love it as a game? That's what I aim to find out with this video. At first there was just darkness, but then I started to see things. This game is regarded by some as the greatest car combat title to ever exist, but let's see if it deserves that praise as a full package. What if we took the storytelling and world out of the conversation, and judged it on its merits outside of just those cutscenes? Pure gameplay and nothing more, where does it stand? Let's play Twisted Metal Black and ask ourselves, is Twisted Metal Black overrated and underhated? We knew that the industry had moved on. We knew that sort of what was edgy and cool in 1994, five and six was no longer edgy and cool in 2001. Twisted Metal Black released in June of 2001 for the PlayStation 2 and was developed by Incog Inc., a studio formed by many of the original developers of the first two Twisted Metal games, including David Jaffe and Scott Campbell. They knew early on that their first project after getting the band back together, that they wanted to return to car combat. They wanted to return to Twisted Metal. However, the decision on which direction to take the iconic series was not as straightforward. Do they play the hits and give players more of what they loved in Twisted Metal 1 and 2, but update it for the far more powerful PlayStation 2 console? Or do they plunge forward into darker, uncharted waters? Given the game that we got, it's clear what option David Jaffe and the team at Incog Inc. chose. Leaping forward a console generation meant a desire to appeal to a more mature player base and to treat the game not as a toy but as a piece of art. They spent as much, if not more, of their creative energy not on the gameplay which they feel they perfected with Twisted Metal 2, but on crafting a world and stories that would act as more than just a colorful backdrop to the all-out carnage. And so what I was in love with on Twisted Metal Black was the world and the tone and the characters and the stories. It would be front and center, the star of the show. Dark, gross, and upsetting themes executed to perfection are what we got, and it showed itself to be the right choice as critics and fans were aligned in their love for this game. Twisted Metal Black holds an impressive 89 score on Metacritic, but even if I knew how to read, I still wouldn't bother with these reviews. I want to get my hands on this game and make that decision myself. So let's get into it. The doctors said it was some kind of amnesia. Loading up the game, the main menu is presented as this stunning diorama exploring a battle frozen in time with each vehicle in the midst of performing some feat of explosive action. I can't think of a single menu in any video game that is more lovingly crafted and creatively designed. It sets a tone that the rest of the game masterfully carries along. I have no notes, it's perfection. As one of the few characters I haven't covered on this channel yet, I decided to ride with a fellow Baldi on this one. So, with controller in hand, I would lead John Doe in a scrapyard chariot into the heart of hell and pull from it the truth he is so desperate for. I'll do my best, but I must warn you, John, I kinda suck at this game. How could I refuse? Roadkill in this game is a green muscle car draped in rust like an apocalyptic caramel apple. And like other versions of Roadkill, it's a junker thrown together from the discarded remains of other cars. John Doe himself is a man with no past, no history, no identity, at least not one that he can remember. There were some days I wondered if I actually existed at all. He finds himself tucked away in Blackfield Asylum, accompanied only by the other psychopaths that haunt this bitter world. But that's not what this playthrough is about. This is about the gameplay. So for the purposes of this video, let's skip his cutscene and just assume he had a wild night out and woke up with some questionable tattoos. Haven't we all? The first level takes us to the Zorko Bros Scrap and Salvage, named after one of the prominent members of the development team, Randy Zorko. This map is a perfect blend of what Twisted Metal Black wants to offer with its new, fresh take on the series. It has a full day-night cycle with dynamic weather, which really means it just goes from poop brown overcast blocking out the sun to midnight rain showers forcing Roadkill's headlights to feebly attempt to cut through the suffocating darkness of night. The arena features a number of hazards and things to interact with, like crushers that run on a constant loop and hide some useful pickups such as health or a skill-based weapon, showing off some of the risk-reward philosophy that Twisted Metal loves and is built on. There is a passenger plane that circles the level until it's brought down by force, giving way to a secret sewer section where you can find and unlock Yellow Jacket. There's a giant Pizza Boy statue who smiles with naive hope that perhaps he can fix this world, restore color, and lift these people out of their awful existence if he can just make a slice of pizza 
tasty enough. Oh, my sweet summer pizza boy. If your first thought is, oh shit dog, where's all the color? I remember Twisted Metal being this wacky, colorful world of wonder and whimsy. This is just dismal and sad. Surely this is just for the first level and there'll be more variety later. I regret to inform you. Nope. These are the same three colors you get for the whole game, with the exception of one level later on. You get Diarrhea Brown, Hopeless Black, and the orange flames flicking into the night air as your opponents run screaming from their destroyed cars. Roadkill as a vehicle is very balanced in terms of speed, armor, and special weapon. It's nimble enough to make a quick getaway when things are getting spicy, tough enough to take a few punches in the thick of combat, and strong enough to punch back and punish enemies for letting you stick around. It's certainly no grim in terms of speed or warthog in terms of armor, but it offers enough in both respects to be a solid choice, even for someone like me who is historically bad at these games. It's worth noting the dramatic change to the feel of this game versus what the PS1 era Twisted Metal games had provided. With the power of the PlayStation 2, we are given a blistering 60 frames per second that feels orders of magnitude faster than any other game in the series. The physics feel far more heavy and grounded than the bouncy moon gravity of previous entries, with vehicles feeling as though they are being dragged to the ground by dark, unknowable forces. With the insane pace of this game and drastically different physics, it takes a bit getting used to, but it's also a deeply rewarding game to master. Dropping in, I immediately started moving, turbo blazing like a torch through the night. There is really no other way to play this game than to make like a shark and keep it moving. The best advice I can give is to play into the chaos because there is no time to make any sense of it. The AI is scripted to deliver ass kickings as swiftly as possible. If you survive more than 30 seconds, it's because the AI allowed you to. But if you stay on the move and never stop shooting, there's a chance you'll come out the other side battle-hardened and victorious. There is a massive amount of weapons to pick up and learn to use with staples such as fire missiles, homing missiles, and power missiles, along with the reworked napalm now called the gas can that lobs an explosive barrel into the air that can be called back down at any time, adding a new level of interactivity to a weapon that has typically been a fire and forget effect throughout the history of the games. Snagging one of the skill-based weapons randomly gives you either a reticle, satellite, or zoomy. Each are extremely powerful but are tricky and time-based to get the most from them. Making a return also is the ricochet that adds more damage should it bounce off a wall and embed itself in your opponent's asshole. Also new to the series are the articulating weapons, which have everything in your inventory pop out from a different compartment of your vehicle, adding to the immersion along with some mental calculus to shooting as weapons with no homing such as the power missile, ricochet, or machine guns will fire from different points on different vehicles. So, in order to land effectively, you'll have to take note which side they are firing from. For instance, on Roadkill, the machine guns are these giant cannons taking up half the windshield. Because visibility, I guess, is for cowards who don't have enough firepower. So if I want to land any of my mega gun shots, I'll need to aim from that spot. After gathering some weapons, I turned my sights to dark side for no other reason than they were closest to me when I was at my most locked and loaded. With the deadly combination of mega guns and a half chub reticle finding their way into the police car dark side as jock strapped to the front of her truck, I was able to bring her down with ease. The field of opponents have had their health bars chipped away enough that I felt comfortable in actually sitting down and leaning into some of these punches and looking for the knockout. Destroying Darkseid was just the opening of the floodgates, the releasing of a torrential gale force whooping of dad ass on Sweet Tooth, who succumbed to fire missile poisoning, Brimstone, who found themselves on the explodey end of a barrage of zoomy missiles, Crazy 8, who failed to escape the blast zone of a gas can, Junkyard Dog, who fell victim to a man-made meteor shower of hellfire, Mr. Grimm, who actually got taken out by Spectre, who I guess got impatient waiting for her turn. It was my darling. My sweetheart. Spectre, listen, desperate is never a good look when looking for love. So I had to swipe left on the woman searching for hot singles in her area. Which takes us to the second level, a choice between suburbs and freeway. I chose suburbs as I feel it better represents this game in terms of its scale, attention to detail, and tone. This map is huge, featuring plenty of distinct and interesting areas to explore, like a neighborhood teeming with pedestrians screaming as all-out carnage unfolds in their own backyard, along with an insane asylum with doctors struggling to quiet their patients, an industrial district with little moped dudes, and a storm cloud brewing above, a carnival with these mustache hot dog stands and a ferris wheel that could be liberated and sent out to sea, and a shopping mall all connected together by winding roads in an ocean of miserable gray with trees dotted around for good measure. My first order of business on this level was to once again get moving, this time down the neighborhood streets as the crooked street lights and run-down houses whiz by at ridiculous speeds, while I chased down Shadow with my limited inventory like a fool. I unloaded whatever I had into the purple hearse, but it wasn't enough to take her out. Thankfully though, the people's champion came through 
through when we needed him most. Manslaughter left a load of his magic exploding rocks on the highway, in the path of the escaping shadow, where she had no choice but to run full speed into the fiery embrace of rock death. Good job, Black. You earned another zipper under your gip suit, or whatever it is you like. I ran around once again to build up my inventory of damage-doing armaments, while taking my signature wimpy pot shots at opponents. I started to discover just how broken Roadkill Special is, with how I dealt with Sweet Tooth. Just a couple of full staff special attacks and he was in the yellow. A gas can topped off with a power missile completed the detonation of one of the toughest enemies in the game. I, I love Sweet Tooth. Just absolute domination from our scrapyard warrior in Roadkill. Later, however, while desperate for health, I tried to find the many health pickups scattered across this map. It'll take quite a few to actually make a dent in the damage I've taken, as they only repair 15% of your total health. Next stop on the Trolling for Health tour was the carnival where I smashed through countless mustache hot dog stands looking for their treasure. None could be found, so the next best thing was to throw myself from the hillside, towards the smoke in the distance hoping that the journey would land me on the rooftop with health. After multiple attempts of overshooting the mark, I found myself in an alleyway with Warthog, who nearly took me down, but he was on the losing end of the self-fulfilling prophecy of assuming my skill was something to respect and fear. Instead of standing there and melting me with his hood-mounted flamethrower as I sat there helplessly roasting like a marshmallow, he just ran off where my many missiles caught up and dispatched him. With some space to myself, I tried once again to ramp the hill to the health, this time noting my speed to ensure I don't fly well over the building. But I approached too slow and came within inches of the health pickup as I tumbled like an idiot off the precipice of safety into the grimy alley where Manslaughter took the opportunity to do what he did to Shadow just minutes ago, and what Warthog didn't have the rock to do, which is clobber me with little remorse. The heavy hand of revenge fell swiftly as I hunted Manslaughter down, got bullied a little bit, before finally force-feeding a homing missile into his stupid face. Absolute chaos ensued on the once quiet streets of this humble suburb. With Junkyard Dog in my sights, I let loose what hell I could, but instead just backed into a wall and nearly tipped over, allowing Axel to step in with his power. He was no match for my special weapon though, which still blows my mind how good it is. Spectre, as impatient as always, waited on the periphery of the battle with Axel, ready to assume the mounted position on the rusty dumper of Roadkill. There was this boy I really liked. One day, I finally got up the courage to tell him. Me not being one to take a compliment well, I immediately leaped off a cliff in an effort to avoid eye contact, where I was killed instantly. Upon landing. Upon respawning, I threw a special attack out into the wild gray yonder and somehow it found a target, Inspector, who I guess is a pick-me girl for high explosives, along with dudes or whatever. With just Junkyard Dog, Grim, and Spectre left, each with low health, it didn't take especially long to take them out, with Spectre only needing the crossfire of my beatdown on Grim to be felled. I scored a decent double kill on Junkyard Dog and Grim to close out the level, so that now I can move on to the choice between Highway Loop and Downtown. I chose Highway Loop for no reason in particular. It just seemed fun, I guess. This map is extremely similar to Freeway Free For All in Twisted Metal 1 and Road Rage in Twisted Metal 4, where it is a continuous winding loop of freeway where mobility and fluidity is more valuable than ever. It also sports a time of day that vaguely implies the sun does exist in this universe. Say what you want about the world of black being an unending sea of awful for the people in it. It seems like sunscreen manufacturers are probably the real victims here. This level is where the difficulty really starts to kick into gear. The first two levels are when the game takes it easy, lulling you into a false sense of security to make it all the more surprising when it does the equivalent of slamming a cactus into your buttocks, letting you know it means business. Within a minute of hopping off the battle bus, I was already destroyed, thanks in part to my skill deficiencies knowing no bounds. I recognized that I needed health and made the decision to go find some, as many would. However, what many wouldn't do is roll around wildly like a breakdancing transformer in the vicinity of a health, only for Junkyard Dog to swoop in and take it before I regained control of my car. Demoralized, I drove off to find another health, but didn't get far since I didn't have health. Respawning, I launched a half mass reticle into Warthog because it was all I could muster, but even that carried a ton of damage with it, giving me hope that even with me dying out of the gate, I could possibly, just maybe, if I really strap up my gamer pants tight, I can pull this out. And Junkyard Dog with the throw of a lifetime dotted me up with a dime from the other side of the planet. I may be no rocket scientist, but I know opportunity when I see it. Okay, so not great. Seven opponents left and I've already died twice on a map where the health bridge has one less use than normal. Undeterred, I marched ever onward into impossible odds because what is adversity if not a catalyst for self-discovery and growth? After all, you can't pull yourself up by your egg straps without cracking a few omelet boots or something. With this courage, I sent Brimstone and the demon living rent-free in his head to the Shadow Realm to get better acquainted, unleashed a flurry of supercharged lead at Warthog, and got alley-ooped by Darkseid, who used my weak Junker car as a projectile that she launched into Outlaw, blowing him up. Maybe I can do this, but uh-oh. Darkseid must have got a little excited because she tried to bump me again, but a little harder this time, and like wet paper pins in the path of a pissed-off bowling ball, 
I stood no chance. I was a bad girl one time. I would like to think she didn't mean to, but it's hard to when she did it with such disrespect and style, which gives me my first game over of this playthrough. Moving on to Highway Loop Round 2. I was determined to slap these cheeks so hard they would spin like windmills and take flight into fuck off land. I hunted down Brimstone like a Terminator, but it took basically a full lap around this level to finish him off, as pedestrian cars are more than happy to eat every one of your shots if it means deflating every prospect you have at taking down an enemy. I finally got a full rager out of this reticle, only to have the majority of the missiles collide with unsuspecting traffic fodder. Even if it took machine guns, I would get Brimstone, and I did. On to my new nemesis, Darkseid. I got her with my special despite her insistence on adding my little car to her collection strapped to the grill of her truck. With her armor depleted, she dipped, or at least tried, but with Turbo and her being an actual f***ing semi-truck, it didn't take long to catch up to her. And at some point, I made the most pathetic attempt at climbing onto the health bridge. I'm not afraid of people seeing me fail like this, because if you can't handle me at my health bridge toppling over, you don't deserve me at my wicked yellow jacket specter double kill, where I took these jokes of competitors from green to nothing and f*** few seconds flat. Suck it. Anyways, now we're on to our first boss battle against Minion, the longtime bane of many a gamer. Known for being a chungus of pain, chilling at the halfway point of Twisted Metal games, after being downgraded from the final boss of Twisted Metal 1, where he was an even chungier chungus. This time, however, he has his own stage, rather than just being tacked on to the end of a level. Known as Minion Stadium, it's an oval-shaped arena with a dirt area in the middle. There is little place to run. The best you can do is circle the map, hoping he doesn't land a shot on you. The boss battle is slightly different from the ones from the rest of the games, with the added complexity that he has a giant force field that doesn't allow you to damage him until the panels on his sides, front and back, are destroyed. I actually made fairly quick work of him, taking the tanker down in just one life. I took lessons from my filthy camper run. I gathered weapons before staying in more or less one spot while I pummel his panels, as he is utterly baffled by my lack of fear. He has a habit of making certain panels a pain to hit by never showing them to you, but I have found that if you just don't move and use your shield to protect yourself, you will eventually just keep turning in place until you see all the panels you need to hit. Once his shield is taken care of, he is a rollover slouch to destroy. Just grab a bunch of power missiles and mega guns, get close enough using your shield, and spam away until he's nothing, not even a memory. Speaking of memory, John is finally starting to remember the man he was before. He forgot it all. He sees him and his friends planning a birthday party or something. I don't think I like the man I'm turning out to be. Anyway, onto Prison Passage, the fifth and most complex arena in the game. This is a level that unravels in a unique and interesting way as the match progresses. You start in a box with two opponents, close quarters, and hard to avoid damage. It's not uncommon for me to die at least once during this opening section, so I didn't feel bad when Darkseid made clear that what she did on Highway Loop was no accident. When the doors open, it reveals that we're actually on a boat riding the high seas of adventure. Two more opponents pop up for this portion, and it's not uncommon for me to die at least once during this too, so I didn't feel bad when Warthog rear-fired a gas can perfectly into me, like the AI he is. It's not an ideal situation to already lose both your extra lives before the boat even docks into port, but what is it to live if not to try? Unfazed with guns blazing, I snagged a big bundle of revenge on Warthog by letting a homing missile go mid-drift in a move that very clearly defines the best parts of Twisted Metal gameplay. High speed, intense, edge-of-your-seat, action-packed combat with your twiddly thumbs controlling it all. This game is unmatched in the satisfaction of landing the perfect shot during a tricky maneuver and seeing your enemies be overtaken by flames that you caused. It feels awesome. With the boat docked and unloaded, I was free to explore the rest of the map, which is Blackfield Asylum, looking much different than it does in the cutscenes. Maybe it's like the coat of paint or something. But there's definitely some changes. Despite not having any lives left, I still kept the aggression on, killing Sweet Tooth, Axel, and Yellow Jacket with relative ease as their health was already drained low enough for the smell of their blood to fill the air. This left only Shadow and Crazy Eight to contend with. And with the absurd power of my special weapon and the wide open nature of this map once it's completely accessible, means I can sit back and snipe away from across the world with really no risk on my part. Shadow was quickly deleted, and before I took on Crazy 8, I decided I should gather some gas cans and environmental attacks for the next level, where I plan to shamelessly cheese it. I asked Crazy 8 if he would be missile punched by me and blown up unceremoniously. His answer was yes, definitely. With Prison Passage dealt with, I can move on to the sixth level, which is a choice between snowy roads and drive-in movie. And anyone who knows the horrors of drive-in knows the only real option is snowy roads, unless you're some kind of pain-seeking masochist. Loading in and full up on gas cans and environmental attacks from the previous level, I got into position on my hillside hidey hole, or at least that was the intention. I instead drove off a cliff into the fog-obscured doom pit, so I exited back 
back to the main menu to reload my saves so that I would have all my weapons back and handy. So this time, for real, I found my secret area that remains a point of brain imploding confusion for the AI. As the opponents would ramp off the cliff to get down here, they would be subjected to the bounce of a gas can and fly off to merge with the infinite, their screams echoing through the uncaring void. One by one, they cast themselves a certain death, but none showed fear. Everything hurt. My face, my mind, my heart. At one point, I was too distracted by watching Grim be claimed by the Abyss that I missed when Shadow came down and they ended up killing me. No matter, it was a good chance to run around and get more weapons for the next level. So that's what I did. At least until Shadow got jealous of the others and begged for me to take her down too. She stopped right in my path where I had no choice but to barrel into her doing my best dark side impression. My parents put me in here. That takes us to the obligatory rooftop stage that every Twisted Metal is required by law to include. Abandoned Skyscrapers is the last traditional level left in the game, and it's a doozy. Eight opponents and another hungry bottomless pit to fall into. Like the rest of the levels, the only way forward to victory is to bravely charge into battle with the whines and moans of missiles as your war cry. I gathered a couple weapons and straight back and forth dealing out damage like bad hands of blackjack to my opponents who knew they had no chance. This map has a few interesting landmarks like the wrecking ball that happened swings to and fro with no concern for the world around it, the crash passenger jet that has started a new career as a ramp to an upper level, and a demonic church complete with localized lightning storm and moody lighting. This map really is just made up of a bunch of wide open areas that are connected by narrow choke points like the bridge with a wrecking ball or the crash passenger jet, which makes it a blast to play on but also leaves you exposed to being bullied by the competition. And they love bullying. I ended up getting destroyed on my approach to the health bridge, which always seems to be placed in such a way that you have to carefully slow down and and climb onto very cautiously. No more true than here, where twice my plans to have my armor restored were thwarted mere feet away from the bridge. Respawning meant plopping me back onto the rooftops that I just died on where the majority of the action was still taking place. But with a couple enemies low on health, that meant an opportunity for a double kill on Warthog and Manslaughter. Those guys aren't the most dangerous opponents to face in this game, but they do have a poop load of armor, so taking them out is a huge weight off this level. My special weapon continues to prove immensely powerful, giving Junkyard Dog no chance to run away, and with Yellow Jacket sensing his fate would be the same, he leapt from atop the skyscrapers into the waiting arms of the concrete below. His car will be his tomb, and the city his cemetery. The rest of these enemies fell with ease, as Crazy 8 put up little resistance, Shadow was no match for my special, and Spectre just hung around waiting for her turn yet again. Once she came down to fight, it took just a few homing missiles to remove her from existence and move on to the final level. A battle with a giant helicopter with a fucking force field? Warhawk has been a truly massive pain in the dingus for me in all the runs I've done on this channel. Especially for vehicles whose specials are useless against a target utilizing an entirely new axis with flight. Junkyard Dog, Mr. Grimm, Brimstone, Darkseid, and Warthog are all completely unable to reliably do damage to Warthog using their special attacks. But thankfully someone mentioned an easy way to do this boss fight. During the initial phase where you have to destroy Warhawk's shield, just sit in the middle where he can't hit you while you take on the tankers and disable the force field. This made that first section trivial, and with the power of Roadkill's special and how it actually knows how to home in on a helicopter, this became a breeze. So, with the game beat, we rewarded ourselves with John Doe getting his prize for besting the competition in combat. I didn't pay attention to most of the ending. Calypso got mad at John Doe, I guess. Probably found an offensive tweet from like 73 years ago and just took matters into his own hands. Cancel culture, run amok. Anyways, playing through Twisted Metal Black and trying to look at this game on the merits of its gameplay and not the world it painstakingly crafted and built in the cutscenes was a blast. The speed, intensity, and strategy in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is some of the smoothest and most satisfying in the series. The power of the PS2 is harnessed and manifests itself as a beautiful, dark, upsetting world that backdrops one of the most engaging and viscerally enjoyable car combat games I have ever played. This game absolutely deserves all the praise it gets from every aspect. Sure, it could use some color, but at least it stays true to the tone that it's set out to exhaustively explore. What else could you want from a game that is unashamedly bleak and oppressively horrifying? I love this game. I love Twisted Metal Black. I love it as a game. Thanks for watching and have a great day. This whole life just waiting for me. All I had to do was this How could I refuse?